Okay, I'm, I'm going to proceed. Um, uh, today I'd like to talk on, uh, uh, I'm getting a lot of echo back, so, so I'm gonna just, I'm, I'm gonna just uh, talk here. Um, today I'd like to talk on arachnoiditis and syringomyelia. Um, arachnoiditis is just a debilitating, debilitating disorder develops after inflammation in the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, there are several sources for this, uh, infection, bleeding, injected chemicals, such as if you have a spinal anesthetic, it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it's the agents that are used to clean the skin, uh, surgical intervention, and uh, trauma. Now there are uh, scarring effects, uh, with arachnoiditis, and they can occur either in the CSF pathways, and in this case, uh, you would develop syringomyelia. You can have scarring of the peel membrane, and that's the membrane on the nerves of the uh, cauda equina or the nerve or around the entire surface of the spinal cord, or the arachnoid membrane. And the arachnoid membrane is the membrane that's outside of the uh, uh, the outside surface of where the cerebrospinal fluid is. That's the membrane that's punctured along with the dura when you have a spinal puncture. Now, arachnoiditis um, causes uh, fibrous scarring. Um, and you would wonder why would you get scarring? The arachnoid itself is not scar tissue, but, and I'll show you on the next slide that there are um, cells called fibroblasts that are within the subarachnoid space. And those are the cells that proliferate. In other words, they divide rapidly. Now, if you have surgery, you need to have what are called wound-associated fibroblasts. And those are the normal fibroblasts. Those are the cells that uh, lay down uh, scar tissue that hold the wound together. That's why your wound ends up uh, being pale and uh, holds together after surgery because you have those uh, wound associated fibroblasts. But, um, you know, there's always the good and the bad in the world. And then we have the uh, fibrosis associated fibroblasts and they are just bad actors. You know, they, um, they don't just uh, heal the wound, but they call what's called fibrogenesis. And that's uh, bad scarring, and that's the scarring that occurs with arachnoiditis. And this uh, proliferation without bounds or without need necessarily, um, that almost is like a cancer type process. It isn't cancer in that, you know, it won't spread to other areas of the body, but you have growth factors and the fibroblasts just grow out of control uh, because of that. So. That's uh, <clears throat> that's what happens in arachnoiditis, and we don't really know why uh, fibrosis-associated fibroblasts are activated in patients with arachnoiditis. It could be genetic. It could be related to the uh, amount of bleeding in the subarachnoid space. Uh, it could be uh, multifactorial. So I have a picture here. Um, I. I can see the pointer on my screen. I don't know if you can see the pointer, um, but uh, this, is a, this is a diagram. You can see the dura uh, here, and the dura is the outside surface. And then you have the arachnoid, which is a fine membrane uh, named after spiders, arachnoids, arachnids. And then you have the CSF space. And uh, inside there, you have some fibroblast cells that that uh, hold the space, uh, uh, they, they go across the space, but they're very fine and they really uh, don't cause any obstruction. Uh, then you get to these arteries and veins and they ride on top of the pia, which is the outer membrane of the spinal cord and, and the blood vessels penetrate through these little, um, what are called perivascular uh, spaces um, or Verkau-Robin spaces into the spinal cord. So when you say 
Some people call this just arachnoiditis, but really the, the long name is adhesive arachnoiditis. And adhesion is the sticking force between surfaces that hold the surfaces together. And in this case, when you have arachnoiditis, the arachnoid is stuck to these blood vessels and it's stuck to the surface of the spinal cord. And that's, um, and you can see that sticking of the arachnoid to these blood vessels will obliterate that space. And that that's a CSF space. And that leads to syringal myelia. If you have scarring of the pia and the arachnoid to the dura, that sticks the spinal cord to the um, dura, and that will cause spinal cord tethering. And you can see if the, the uh, membranes, the arachnoid membrane sticks to these blood vessels, that obviously it can, um, can have effects on the blood vessels as well. So uh, we did a study at the NIH, and uh, we thought we uh, uh, came up with a reasonable uh, mechanism uh, for the development of syringal myelia with arachnoiditis. And what really people don't argue about is whether the block is related to arachnoiditis and um, is related in turn to the uh, syrinx formation. The, if you have a block, you can develop a syrinx. If you relieve the block, the syrinx usually goes away. Uh, once CSF uh, accumulates within the spinal cord, uh, we've seen on CINE MRI and on ultrasound studies that the fluid moves uh, within the spinal cord with each heartbeat, and that uh, lengthens the syrinx. So we did a study at the NIH uh, with uh, 36 patients with arachnoiditis and syringal myelia, and our follow-up time, uh, average time was 4.3 years, and the patients had an average age of 40, uh, 43 years. So all patients underwent laminectomy. That's the procedure most people have when they have um, arachnoiditis. And they had a laminectomy. Not, you have to leave the B out of laminectomy. And this is so. This didn't happen to me in one case where uh, we, we pulled something out. We thought it must be the source of the bleeding. Um, so the surgical treatment of arachnoiditis through laminectomy is successful if the arachnoiditis is not very adhesive. In other words, I'm showing here an arachnoid cyst. Whereas, you know, the, the cyst looks almost like the arachnoid. So it has some fibroblasts in it, but not to the extent that we would see with extensive or severe arachnoiditis. And these cysts press on the spinal cord, you remove these, um, and the uh, patients generally do well. In this case, the patient had an associated syrinx, as you can see on the screen on the left side, the uh, uh, dark fluid uh, in the, uh, or the dark signal within the spinal cord on the far left image. Uh, here's another patient uh, in the series, and you can see there's a syrinx inside the spinal cord on the center uh, image on the right, on the right side of the center image. And you see, I have some cystic formation, uh, and then you have some cysts and, and some uh, bands of scar as well, but still it's not adhesive. In other words, you didn't put two pieces of adhesive tape together there. You, you have some openings uh, between the fibers. All right, and um, so these these people did pretty well. Here's one of the patients we operated on. You could you could say, yes, there is some fibrosis there. This, you can see the spinal cord through the arachnoid superiorly, the spinal cord inferiorly. The blood vessels look fine, and this is just a, sort of a, a small matter uh, to remove that fibrous lesion because, granted, there are more fibroblasts there than normal, but the scarring is very minimal, and those patients do very well. So after surgery for the whole group, uh, most patients over the four and a half year period uh, stayed the same or improved. However, you can see that 
the results as far as the percentage is is um, is not really that different for subjective uh, weakness. But what I'd like to uh, draw your attention to is the non-ambulatory patients. Initially, 22% of the patients uh, couldn't walk. Uh, three months, they, they held that. Um, so it really didn't change. But, but at the 4.3 year point, you have almost twice as many people who couldn't walk. So some of the patients, obviously there's a difference in six uh, between 14 and eight. Some of the patients uh, did get worse over time uh, despite surgery. So we looked into that and we realized that there were the patients with a very nice outcomes that I showed with the, uh, you know, they have little disease, um, and the syrinx, and they do real well with surgery. That, those are happy days when that happens. They don't have to do too much surgery, only uh, three or less uh, laminectomies to treat them. However, the, the patients with poor outcomes, their syrinxes didn't get smaller after surgery. They didn't get any shorter after surgery. Uh, their blocks weren't re relieved, and we worked harder on them than on the patients with minimal disease. And, and our reward for that was that the patients actually did worse. So uh, to summarize, uh, if you treat arachnoiditis and it's limited, uh, patients do quite well and the, the syrinxes go away. And that's because you might have a cyst or a, a single band of arachnoid compressing the, the surface of the spinal cord. And those, those the operations we do, we really don't cre create much scarring because of the the incision and the dura is not very long, and we really don't uh, manipulate many structures other than cutting a band or removing a, a cyst. On the other hand, um, if we did many, many levels, you can see uh, below this uh, line, the zero line, is that those are um, the effects of the syrinx getting smaller after surgery. But you can see as you go to the right, as the number of laminectomy, laminectomy levels go up, um, most of the time the syrinx would get larger or not uh, get much smaller. Um, and this was from a, a recent patient. Uh, you can see that even though we look longitudinally, in other words, how long, how, how, how many segments of the spine are affected by the arachnoiditis. Uh, in this case, um, you can see that the, the, there's a cyst there. I, I have an arrow to it, but the spinal cord is stuck against what's called the dura on the other side of the spinal canal. And we thought the cyst was doing that, but in, in fact, uh, there were adhesions, just like uh, the uh, tape analogy I showed, uh, I talked about before, the spinal cord was actually stuck to the uh, other side of the spinal canal. So it wasn't just minimal scarring uh, that can be removed uh, easily and you, you, can look, you can look in and see what you have to cut right away. And this uh, took a lot of uh, work to uh, release that. Okay, so I haven't made a very uh, compelling case for uh, laminectomy, extensive laminectomies uh, for extensive arachnoiditis that extends several uh, vertebral levels. So why not use shunts? Well, we do use shunts. Shunts are used as an option of last resort. And uh, unfortunately, they have limited benefit. Some people, say 30% of patients, benefit. It all depends on what your symptoms are coming from. If they're mostly, your symptoms mostly come from the syrinx or from the scarring. Unfortunately, with extensive arachnoiditis, most patients have most of their deficit that originates not from the syrinx, but from the arachnoiditis. And so the benefit that can occur with a successful shunt is for the syrinx symptoms to improve. Um, 
shunts have many potential complications such as infection, malfunction, and spinal cord tethering. Um, but uh, as I said, if you have nothing else, uh, uh, because the uh, adhesions are very extensive, perhaps uh, you know you have to look at the cost benefit. But perhaps a shunt uh, would uh, help. Dr. Batstorff, who's been coming to these conferences for many years and is an expert on Chiari and Syringomyelia, he uh, he did a study of uh, shunts in Syringomyelia, and you and you can see. And you know he wouldn't use shunts unless uh, there there was no other uh, option. And you can see over time, good options are up by the the 1.0. That's uh, 100 percent of the patients doing well. But you can see. Over time, uh, in the one group where uh, the shunt was put in at the level of scarring, uh, virtually everyone uh, deteriorated uh, by three years. And if uh, the shunt was placed outside the level of scarring, it would take about five years before uh, the patients uh, became worse. So um, that's not a very optimistic uh, appraisal of the treatment of uh, extensive uh, arachnoiditis and syringomyelia. So what is being done to try to improve care? Well, here's an example uh, where uh, someone did a what's called a laminoplasty uh, above and below an area where the uh, spinal cord was compressed uh, slightly. And uh, they found a cyst there. And so rather than opening up a five level laminectomy, they were able to do what's called a two level laminoplasty and passed a shunt tube uh, th through that area to confirm that the CSF was flowing. Now, I think some people might say that a more limited laminectomy without, um, without uh, putting the uh, shunt tube uh, through the cyst would have been adequate, but uh, I wasn't there. And uh, But this is just one thing that's being tried. It doesn't seem like uh, the arachnoiditis in this case was uh, very severe. Um, there have been several reports in the literature about using spinal endoscopy as an adjuvant. Uh, adjuvant means that in addition to standard therapy, uh, I give a reference here, uh, Dr. Tan, World Neurosurgery, he reported uh, using a spinal endoscope, he, he just uh, did a one-level laminectomy, a T3 laminectomy, and he was used. He used uh, spinal endoscopy to put in a syringal subarachnoid shunt in a patient with a severe arachnoiditis, and it seemed like there was some effect on the searing size after that, although um, no uh, real effect on the extensive arachnoiditis. And you can see that. The, uh, this is a flexible endoscope, and this is uh, this is just um, my colleagues and myself uh, in the operating room uh, using the endoscope on one of our cases. So I want to show you this is this was the first time we used the endoscope. This is a person who was uh, totally uh, paralyzed from trauma, but then his syrinx extended uh, into the cervical area, so he was starting to get some upper extremity. Uh, symptoms of weakness and numbness. So, um, so we used what's called the rigid endoscope there because uh, he really had no uh, spinal cord function in this area here. And we thought that by opening up the subarachnoid space, and uh, what I'm doing there is stretching these uh, bands of scar and trying to get down to this one area where you can see that. Uh, if you can connect those areas of drainage there, then you can open up the subarachnoid space. And so uh, the pictures are nice. Uh, you have a limited view there. That's um, what we showed is that we were able to open up posteriorly, but we couldn't go all around the, uh, the surface of the spinal cord like you yeah, because that's with extensive arachnoiditis, that's usually the case that you have. The, the arachnoiditis is not just long, but it also goes around the spinal cord. So here's another 
uh, case of us using the endoscope. This is when we use the flexible endoscope. Those are nerve roots there. Here's the, the spinal canal. This is after we did a laminectomy. So we, um, and this was a, a lady in her 70s who uh, had a um, some bleeding in the in the spinal fluid and later developed the searing. So you can see the bleeding set up all this scarring. And so really there's just a, a very small passage. Those are the blood vessels on side the uh, on the on the surface of the spinal cord. If we get down there, um, there's so much scarring you can't even see uh, that there's a spinal cord there. Push this down and then and then there you can is a very, very small opening. And that um, the, the tissue's orange because of the previous uh, bleeding. Uh, that's, that's just breakdown products of the blood. All right. So let's get practical here. So what questions should a patient ask uh, before having treatment of, for uh, arachnoiditis and syringomyelia. So you should ask, well, what are your chances of benefiting from surgery? I, I think if you have limited uh, arachnoiditis, you probably have improved spinal cord function, at least preserved function, and it would be better than you could expect without surgical treatment. If you have extensive arachnoiditis, I think that the risk benefit is, is uh, much less uh, certain there. It might be, and in many cases, um, you just have, even if the patient wants to have surgery, you just have to say, look, I, I don't think it will help. Um, but we're hopeful that with uh, endoscopy and with some other methods, perhaps uh, the risk benefit uh, equation could be changed a little bit. And the um, there is a risk of permanent harm, such as paralysis from surgery. And even if you do succeed with uh, the surgery, as I showed with Dr. Uh, Badstorff's uh, graph, uh, the patients uh, often get worse uh, with time, and sometimes that's due to the syrinx, and other times it's just related to the effects of the uh, chronic arachnoiditis. Now, how could we, what are some other approaches? Well, one approach would try to, try to, uh, prevent uh, arachnoiditis from starting or even recurring. Um, it's a little bit tricky because if you use steroids like dexamethasone, you can perhaps reduce the adhesions, but you do need fibroblasts to heal your wound. So you can't, if, if your wound is leaking spinal fluid, you're likely to get infection and so forth. So um, I think that uh, you can use some of dexamethasone if the wound has healed or is healing well. And one thing that's been unexpected is that the finding that even with mild traumatic brain injury, inflammation can persist uh, for up to 12 months. And so that might be the case with uh, spinal trauma or surgery. So maybe our pessimism about using steroids uh, after the wound is healed, maybe that's unfounded and maybe there would be some uh, basis for that. Um, if you can't treat the problem directly, you can treat the uh, problems that arise uh, from arachnoiditis, such as uh, chronic pain. And uh, people will go into this, but chronic pain can have uh, many, many uh, adverse effects and it can affect your emotions and uh, and just your love of life in general. Um, there are many things to treat pain that don't involve uh, medications, and I'm sure uh, speakers will talk about that. Uh, on the uh, horizon for, and one of, uh, actually, a syringomyelia and arachnoiditis patient uh, sent this to me uh, and reminded me, I saw this uh, a few years ago, but. Uh, People are talking about spinal regeneration and, and putting new cells in uh, really doesn't hold as much promise as, as having the neurons that you have bridging deficits. And in, uh, in syrinx patients, for example, the 
the nerves for movement uh, that come from the brain, it's the, the nerves are there, they just are, are broken. And if, if people have um, paralysis or they might not be myelinated. And so restoring their ability to, to reach their connections in the, um, what are called the anterior horn, anterior horns of the uh, spinal cord where the motor fibers are to the muscles, that uh, holds a lot of promise for uh, people regaining uh, neurologic function from spinal cord injury. And uh, this uh, trial here will go into phase one uh, studies uh, within maybe a year. And then after that, it will go into uh, phase two studies. So um, I'm, I'm really uh, cautiously optimistic about this. So um, we, you know, because of COVID, we had to almost shut down for a while, but now we're we're coming back at the clinical center. So uh, we um, really appreciate the patients who've uh, participated in our studies. Um, they're very courageous and uh, really, uh, they've they've really helped out our understanding of uh, cerebral myelia. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll learn more about arachnoiditis and, uh, and this particularly the uh, extensive type and we will improve treatment for this uh, debilitating condition. So uh, thank you very much.